from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Theodosia Austin with the American Folklife Center, and I'm here today on July 11th, 2013, with three members of Harmonia, an amazing band that just played um, a concert here at the Library of Congress. I want them to each introduce themselves, and then we're going to talk about their lives as musicians. My name is Andrei Pitkivka. My name is uh, Alexander Federuk. My name is Walt Mahovlich. And um, I'd like to start the interview with Walt. Uh, Walt is the founder of Harmonia, and um, you have a very interesting background, very typically American in some ways. But um, can you tell us about your, your background and where yeah. it all started? Sure. I, I can tell you about my background. And I grew up thinking it was typically American. And it, and it is in a lot of ways. but. Uh, there are lots of ways of being typically American. Uh, my grandparents came to the United States at the uh, uh, around the turn of the last century. In the fact, the, in fact, the last one of my grandparents came uh, exactly 100 years ago in 1913. Uh, my mother's parents came from Hungary. My father's parents came from uh, well, what was then Austria-Hungary, but it is now Croatia. Um, in typical, typical of kids of their generation, they did not learn to speak English till they were about eight years old uh, when they started school. Uh, I grew up, I was born in Cleveland and uh, lived the first few, few years of my life right in the city of Cleveland and then we moved out to uh, a suburb called Bedford, which actually, it's not the usual kind of picture of a suburb. It was had been a small town that was absorbed. Uh, the neighborhood I grew up in, uh, you know, people had, you know, names like uh, last names like Podolsky, uh, Novik, uh, Nehoda, all this sort of stuff. Typical American names, as far as I knew. Uh, all of the, all the white folks I was around, everybody had foreign-speaking grandmothers, and I assume that was the case, for everybody. Um, I mean, as time went on, I knew there were other folks, but that just seemed like. You know what real life that was. was. That was my that was my experience. And you know, as far as food and culture and music, uh, that was just a part of everyday life. I mean, the food that we ate. In retrospect, now I see. I mean, not that we never had you know exotic food like pizza or hot dogs or things <laughs> like that. But you know, typically we were eating traditional foods and. Uh, the music I would hear, I mean, of course, my parents did like bi big band music, too, and as did I, but what they really liked, they loved hearing Croatian music, they loved hearing Hungarian music. Uh, the first song that, the first two songs I remember learning were two songs in Croatian from my father. Uh, one was called Sve Sutsure Lepe, and uh, the other one was Mladi Kapetane, which are, you know, old... Croatian and turn of the century sort of one's a polka, one's a ballad. Uh, we would go to picnics where we would hear musicians play. Um, uh, my parents had grown up in the Ohio River Valley around uh, the steel mills and kind of uh, coal patches. That was that, a big draw. It, it was a big draw. There were a lot of people of our backgrounds there. A lot of people went first to Pittsburgh. Other people went to central Pennsylvania. And so there was a big community of people, I mean, as insiders, we called ourselves hunkies. We didn't want anybody else calling us that. Uh, but that's what we called ourselves, and we knew what we meant by that shorthand, which meant that you were a Slav or a Hungarian or a Romanian or maybe a Lithuanian, but you shared that kind of East European background. Uh, some of my friends were purebred in the sense that their, their parents were of the same ethnic background, but more typically, uh, would be somebody like me, where you're a, uh, you know, a, a child of a Hungarian married to a Croatian, or a Slovak married to a Pole, or a uh, well now they call them 
Carpathian Rusins, but at the time they called him a Ruthenian, you know, maybe married to a Hungarian or something like that. And that was kind of the typical thing. And we had a lot in common. Uh, as a kid, I was not a member of, you know, the typical church dance group or that sort of thing. People who've, who lived a little further uh, in towards town were more likely uh, to be involved in that. But I did grow up hearing the music. We oftentimes would make trips, particularly my mother would take me on trips to uh, into more of the inner city of Cleveland to uh, an area called Buckeye Road, which uh, for her was like going back to her childhood and going and going back in a way to Hungary because all of those signs were in Hungarian, some of them were in Slovak. Uh, this is the language you heard on the street. Would go sometimes at night to uh, places like the Settlers Tavern, to the bit of Budapest uh, Gypsy Cafe, and there there would be gypsy musicians playing. You know, violins, cymbalum, bass, very much like what you hear Harmonia doing now. Um, and when did you start playing? When I started playing, well, I started playing. Uh, Hungarian tunes very early, but I was playing them on the piano. You know, there's a piano in the house. As far as Hungarian music went at the time, it was kind of a closed shop. It was kind of a closed shop. I mean, if you were not tight with the families that played music, and they were primarily uh, Roma, or as they would call themselves in English, gypsies. I mean, they were gypsies. Then you didn't really have an opportunity to learn to play that professionally. Um, and I, I just sort of screwed around with it. And, you know, I also played clarinet, and I mean, I heard Croatian music again because I was living in a place where it would have been hard to go and find people to teach me. I mean, it would have been an hour's drive or something like that, which seemed like a lot at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not what happened. I, I think what really ignited my interest in actually playing the music was when I went away to college. I. Uh, went to a place called Hope College in Holland, Michigan, a nice little school. I went there in 1970, uh, and I immediately felt like a fish out of water. Uh, I didn't, you know, I was used, to, well, of course, I was used to being in a city like Cleveland, and suddenly I was in a place that had a very different ethnic mix, and I realized that I was different, and I became very conscious of my background uh, and that our customs and our foods and our taste in music and everything was very different. Uh, I mean, not that people were rude to me or anything like that. It's just that suddenly I knew this was not the place for me and, and I wanted to be who I was. Uh, at the same time, there were some relationships between Hope College and the University of Sarajevo. And so there were some uh, uh, some professors from Yugoslavia who were visiting and who I became friends with. And when I went home, uh, well, first off, I did decide I uh, one year was quite enough. I wanted to get back to Cleveland and the, the sort of people and culture that I liked. Uh, I then went to Case Western Reserve, smack dab in the middle of the city of Cleveland, and I could fully participate in the uh, you know culture culture that I sprang from. You know, now, you know, I'm right there. I want to go to Buckeye Road and hear, hear music, I can do that. And if I want to learn to play the timbre, it's a, I, in principle, I could do that. I did learn to do it, but not very well. It's not, strings are not my thing in terms of playing. And in short order, you know, I was hanging out with a lot of newcomers, certainly newcomer Croatians, and was playing music. And because there was this con country called Yugoslavia at the time, uh, I, and I was taught no prejudices against uh, other people. I was not taught to be prejudiced against uh, Serbs or Macedonians or whatnot. But we got along and we played together. And the next thing you know, that's what I'm doing every single weekend is I'm going out and playing weddings. Um, and when I wasn't doing that, I mean, of course, when I wasn't doing that, you know, I was being a frat boy and drinking beer and all that kind of thing. But, but when I wasn't doing that, when I wasn't actually going out and playing, I was going to these things. And... Uh, I spent a lot of time going to dances and weddings. You know, I'd go over to the St. Helena's Romanian church. I'd go down to the, you know, Serbian church. I'd go to the Greek events and whatnot. And I 
really absorbed this and I really felt part of all of that. Um, and then you, you decided at one point to go to Sarajevo. I did, I did. I had the, I had run out of money trying to go to school at Case Western Reserve and at one point uh, through connections with uh, Dr. Petrovich at the uh, University of, uh, or not the university, but rather at Hope College, he had an exchange pro program, so I was able to go to Sarajevo. But what I should back up and say is that when I came back to Cleveland and started going to Case Western Reserve, I became determined to learn to speak, uh, to learn to speak Serbo Croatian. You know, I knew a little bit at that point. Uh, I was able to take it in school a little bit, so get a handle on the grammar, which of course is very different than English or French and whatnot. But once I did that, my family was thrilled absolutely thrilled. I could talk to them. They were very supportive of that sort of thing. Uh, and then that also meant that I was able to go to Sarajevo, which was, which was great. I also was able on that trip to go and look up friends that uh, throughout the country that I had actually met uh, at the 1976 Smithsonian Festival of Folklife. I performed at the Smithsonian Festival of Folklife. I, uh, uh, their field worker, Richard Murch, found the Macedonian band I was playing in, and we, it was a typical band. I mean, this is, you know, I, you know, here I am, Croatian and, Croatian and Hungarian, I was playing clarinet with the band. Uh, Chris Toloff was a Macedonian, he and his son, who played drums, played accordion and drums, and then their, uh, their cousin, who was half Serbian, was playing trumpet, Danny uh, Zagaritz, and they, and there was this great sort of family reunion with these guys from Europe who were there. And I said, okay, well, you know, I'll come see you sometime. And sure enough, you know, the very next year, that's what I ended up doing. And that was, that was a great deal of fun. Um, you know, I also did find out a little bit about, well, I did find out quite a bit about the discipline that they called ethnology. Uh, you know, certainly in the East European system, we divided things a little differently. The cultural anthropology, basically, under du uh, under Dunja Richman, and it was quite interesting. I flirted with the idea of maybe I would like to study this, but I realized after doing that, and I, I did do some work for a project called the Cleveland Ethnographic Museum, which also put me very much in touch with many ethnic groups in in Cleveland. So you you learned, although your your degrees are in engineering and chemistry. Yes, absolutely. But this was a little side but trip in the 70s. this is a little side trip. Yeah. And you also, you started doing field work. Well, I did. For, uh, I and did, then when I you did. came, and then you were and able then to And then I did that. that. I, I did do that. I did some field work in Cleveland, and I did, you know, I produced this album, which I think that you have here at the museum, at the uh, Library of Congress, the, uh, oh, what, how did Russia we put Domovina? it? Yeah, Nova Domovina. No, Nova, Nova Domovina. Nova Domovina. No, Nova Domovina, which is the... <laughs> You know, new homeland, uh, the mm -hmm. traditional music of the industrial Midwest of, of Southern Slavs in the industrial Indians. Midwest. Mm -hmm. We had to be careful how we put that. Yes, that was a very because although everyone gets a, was getting along and playing music, it's still there. Were still were plenty of people who did not get along, <laughs> and they were typically not playing music with each other, <laughs> but they were certainly criticizing it. Mm -hmm. uh, however, after doing that for a while, you know, I I thought about it and I said, you know. I love studying this stuff, but I love being it and doing it. I like to play music. I don't so much like to observe weddings. I like to play at weddings. I like to be part of them. I, uh, and that kind of set me on my career at the time. I, you know, I went and finished my degree in chemistry, and then after a while went on with polymer science, and then ended up on the East Coast. And during this whole period, you know, I was playing, well, initially with Croatians, but then with Macedonians, also with Serbs, uh, you know, a number of orchestras, I'm sure you've got a, a listing of that. Um, you know, people like Radisimovic. Uh, and certainly the first 10 years I was playing, I don't think I played with anybody who could read a note, which is a very good way to learn folk music, honest to God. Yes. I mean, you have to develop your ear. You have to develop a feel for things, and you also have to realize if you're playing different kinds of stuff, it's got to sound different. It has to sound the right way. So, you know, right off the bat, you know, I had in my ears 
uh, what Croatian music was supposed to sound like. Sadly, on tumbrids, I couldn't do that very well. Although later on, I was playing in a tumbrids orchestra with accordion, which was part of it, and I can sound like that, and I do, mm -hmm. and know mm -hmm. those hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of songs. But uh, you know, it, it taught me an appreciation also for other people's music. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, learned to play. As I say, I learned this gigantic repertoire. Although I was gigantic as it is now, after radio festivals came around, you know, I learned the Macedonian re wedding repertoire for, and I, you know, I learned that when you go play wedding, you find out when they came to the United States, where they're from, and about how old they are, and then you know what to play. Yeah. You know, you got to ask those questions, otherwise, you, you're not going to understand it, and and you have to do it by seeing what the insiders like, and. And you, you all play, I mean, with harmonica yeah, in particular, we, totally. for community events, for Oh, yeah, weddings. absolutely. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And, I'm, and I mean, and these guys came out of that. I mean, they came out of doing that in Europe. Uh, and, I, you know, I don't know as much about Andri in this regards, but, I mean, you were also found yourself not just playing for Ukrainians. I mean, you would go to and play for Moldavians and, and folks like In Bukovina, that. yes. Yeah, in Bukovina. So, you know, there's some, you know, there's some of that. But, I mean, so my ears were kind of already open to this and I appreciated it. And there's kind of a fellow feeling that I was raised with, and I guess you guys maybe experience it somewhat, particularly among Slavs, that, you know, of course there are all these horrible headlines about how we have wars and murder each other and do this sort of thing, but there's a kind of idea that on, on some level we're kind of all related. I don't know, I mean, you, yeah. your experience may have been different. That in the, in the U.S., that, and certainly among the generation of my parents and you know my generation, we were raised to feel that. We were raised to feel that, and that sort of opened me up to it. And then it's not a big leap to, you know, feel that way to other people who are not <coughs> Slavic, who are from Eastern mm -hmm. Europe, you know, particularly you know Hungarians and Romanians, because there are other things in in common there. So anyway, I, I left Cleveland, took a job on the East Coast in. Uh, uh, in New Brunswick, New Jersey, which turned out to be, unbeknownst to me, uh, the home to a great big uh, Hungarian community. And, you know, so music's going on all the time. I happened to move onto a street where there was a cafe at the end of it, which I didn't know about when I, when I moved there. And so, you know, Sunday nights, I'd go down there, and things really got going about midnight after the regular patrons had, had gone home and the musicians the gypsy musicians particularly, who had been playing in, the, uh, in Philadelphia and New York started filtering in. And so that was a lot of, that was a lot of fun. Uh, it's also at that point that I started playing with Romanians. I mean, I wasn't playing with Hungarians at that point, really. You know, I knew some tunes, but again, you know, I didn't imagine I was going to do this. Um, and I was, you know, playing ethnic gigs also because of the metropolis that New York is I uh, got exposed to a lot of really amazing musicians of one sort or another. And also, I think that's the first time that I was exposed to musicians who did not themselves come from East European backgrounds, mm -hmm. but um, were both really interested in a respectful way in our music mm -hmm. and could also play it very well. And, you know, began playing with some of those guys. I mean, I no sooner got to New Jersey than I was hooked up with a Tumbridge orchestra that was based in in uh, eastern Pennsylvania, and I would get my sort of Midwestern dose of hunkiness by going to uh, Stilton, Pennsylvania, where there was a great, you know, there was Hungarian community, or excuse me, there was a Croatian community, Serbian community, also Macedonian community, because I'd go there and play for their dances and go to their picnics, the, Hungary, the Croatian picnics. Uh, also, there was stuff going on in Philadelphia. It was different, somewhat different than back home, but it felt like back home. Uh, New York, as much as I loved it, it didn't feel like back home, the events I went to, because it's a different, it's just a different mix. Well, anyway, to make a very long story short, uh, in 88, uh, I was offered a job in Cleveland to come back. Uh, to you know, work as a polymer scientist, which was what I was doing at the time. I came back, you know, with visions of playing music and began to play, you know, this sort of Macedonian and 
and sort of pan Yugoslav stuff I was doing. I uh, around that time, some fraternity brothers of mine, because I still kept in in touch with them at the university, said, "Hey, there's this young violinist. You should meet him. Uh, he says he really likes gypsy music, and uh, he also likes to play klezmer music, which I had played some in my day too, because it's." In terms of spirit, when you're playing a wedding, it's like it's Easter Easter European music, and I play clarinet. It's great stuff on clarinet, and that was Stephen Greenman, and I met him, and sure enough, he was interested in playing this stuff. And you know, I remember we had a wonderful jam session at my house where we went through playing some Hungarian Chatterjee tunes with me on accordion, and and Stephen on violin. Uh, then, you know, we're playing a little bit. We played on the radio for, I don't know, some college radio festival. It was kind of fun. I wasn't thinking about it as being particularly professional, uh, though he was very good and remains so. Um, we, uh, I was copying some music, actually some Ukrainian music. I remember exactly. Some Ukrainian music from, from an old publisher in uh, Philadelphia. And a little old lady comes up to me and looks over my shoulder and says, Oh, <coughs> you play music? Yes, yeah, I do. Oh, what kind of music? Well, folk music. Oh, folk music. Oh, my husband, Joseph, he played very good folk music. Well, this woman was um, Ergi Elizabeth Varga, whose husband, uh, whom she introduced me to. I said, yeah, you know, he plays bass. We f I find out, oh, I'd love to meet him. And she explains, and, oh, you're Hungarian? Oh, I'm Hungarian, too. Uh, he was an old bass player, <coughs> a very well-educated, wonderful player. He was himself He was himself a gypsy from Oradia Mare, uh, also known as Nadvorad in, Hung in Hungarian, from, but within the territory of Romania. And... He then got together with me and Stephen. I invited him over to my house. And the first piece we played was a piece called Yo Eshte Kivano. Good evening, everybody. Name of a famous Jadadash that he used to start off, uh, start off a dance. Okay. And he was thrilled. He was very happy. And he said, oh, you play gypsy chords for this. I did. I mean, and it was kind of by luck uh, that I happen to, you know, know the proper chords to play for it because, different than the other music I had played before, the stuff from Hungary in particular, and also from Slovakia, but particularly Hungarian stuff, yeah. it's quarterly, really complex. It's not obvious. Uh, it's very intense. Yeah, I mean, it's you because you've played Croatian and Serbian stuff with me, and it's it's yeah. nowhere near this, but that got him going to the point. That he was, you know, willing to teach us, and that was that was something, you know. I mean, Steve didn't need to be taught how to play violin. He certainly played it perfectly finely, but how to play this kind of music he needed. And for me, the experience of becoming an accompanist, I've done that a little bit with a, a Romanian band I was in with the with the late George Kaba, uh, based in Pennsylvania. But through this, you know, I began really to learn about the chord structure and to actually kind of have the guts to play out. Well, things picked up very quickly, uh, which will lead to the movement of, of meeting these guys. The, uh, uh, around the same time, uh, a couple of dance and music groups were, this is around 1991 now, uh, so there were some changes afoot in Eastern Europe. And, you know, first uh, a group came from uh, Fagarash in Romania, uh, our good friend who we play with, who's, who was one of the kind of originals of Harmonia, and that we have recorded with uh, Georgi Tarmitsash, a phenomenal Taragot player. Uh, we became friends with him. He started to play with us some, and I mean, he came with a, this amazing band. He and his brother had, had a band in, in Romania that came with a great dance group. And they completely changed the face of Romanian music in northeastern Ohio, completely, because it really was more about, I mean, even the stuff I was hearing in the 70s, that was pretty much gone. There was nobody to play it. But suddenly there were good players. And he was sharing the stuff. 
and uh, yeah, that was with the, the fall of Ceausescu. There, the fall, it, it happened exactly with the fall of Ceausescu. <laughs> it became possible at that point for musicians to leave. It didn't necessarily, unfortunately, at the same time, it became much more hard, mm -hmm. much more difficult for people to get in here. Um, you know, at the same time, <clears throat> you know, in his, in his case, you know, he comes with this, and, and there are also all these people now who are really great dancers in it brings back the dance culture. And I'm not talking about on stage, because they knew how to dance on stage, of course. And, and, and that was something that was continuing in, in Cleveland, but it sort of reinforced this. And I think throughout the East European communities, by having these people suddenly able to come to the US, not only able to, but having a reason to, because the situation for musicians in a lot of countries became kind of grim, you know, suddenly, there's not the state support that there was over there. And there wasn't, I know for like Georgie and some other people, there wasn't the kind of money to pay for the big expensive weddings. Mm -hmm. And there were also other things for people to buy with that money. So there was kind of a push-pull. But you know, for me, that was great. Uh, a few, uh, I had an opportunity to buy an American-made symbol in the early 90s. I'd always wanted to play the instrument. It was my favorite instrument. I would go and watch this guy, Alex Udvari, play at the Settlers uh, Tavern in Cleveland, and I was fascinated. My mother's favorite instrument. And finally, here I am now in my, my 40s, and I get a chance to buy one. And I did. Uh, an American-made one. It was a pretty decent instrument. Um, and a few months later, uh, Joseph Varga, comes in with a young guy in a leather coat and says, I want you to meet this fellow. And here he was, uh, Elam Hermes, uh, you know, another Roma guy who had studied at the Least Institute, uh, who sat down and began to play the cymbal. Well, and he had a son-in-law who also played violin. And so then we started playing, you know, then we started playing gigs. I mean, before that, we had played a few gigs, particularly for the Carpathian Rusins, and I think for the Slovaks in town, you know, with the sort of violin harmonia set up. That's kind of when harmonia was starting. After about a year or so, however, our, uh, the Cymbalum player's wife didn't, she didn't like the climate in Cleveland. She wanted to go back to California or Toronto, and why doesn't her husband just get rid of this instrument, which is dragging them down? And <laughs> she made him sell his instrument. Oh, well, okay. so which oh no, he and, and the happy news is he's got one, and he's sitting in California, and he's doing fine. But uh, so he asked me if I'd like to buy it, and I said, well, let me see what we could do. I did a little wheeling and dealing, and so I found somebody who was interested in my symbol, who was an amateur who always wanted to play, and I uh, bought this beautiful bohawk that you. If we recorded the concert, you saw that. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an instrument. There's a cymbal, but no cymbal player. There's a bass player. <laughs> there's a violinist, and I, and I and Stephen and a friend of ours, Henry, who's a bass player from uh, Pittsburgh. He uh, <clears throat> has us perform at a concert, and in fact, uh, let's see. You just had the Anski. Mm -hmm. Folks, yeah, well, Michael Albert was actually singing at that that very concert. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, we went back to somebody's house in uh, Pittsburgh. Do you remember her name, Lynn, somebody or other? <laughs> no, Lynn. Yeah. Lynn, I don't remember. Well, name. she happened to have. There happened to be a couple of symbols in the house. I mean, I think one was a Centauri, but there was a symbol. I met this guy who told me he was from Ukraine, and that he was going to Duquesne University, and that he played symbol. And I said, "Oh, that's great! I didn't really realize." You know, I knew they played Cymbali, the small one in Ukraine, but I didn't really realize they played Cymbalum. Well, we had a jam session, an after-concert party, and Alex sits down to play. And, you know, there's Albert and some of the guys mm -hmm. he plays with, and me and Steven. And when I heard this guy play, and also fearlessly play stuff he didn't know, that's a big, <laughs> that's a big <laughs> thing. I mean, that, that's a really, really big thing, to not be afraid to try playing something that you don't know. Uh, yeah. Because on, on, if you're a good musician, on some level you already know it. I think that's that'd be fair to say. I said, okay, he's coming to Cleveland. <laughs> I'll find a way. And uh, let's see, you, yeah, because you were interested in 
getting, you know, pursuing ethnomusicology at the time, and also yes. getting your degree recognized, which, you know, because the be academic, it's a challenge. I mean, the academic system, uh, particularly in the post-war period in Eastern Europe and in the U.S., it didn't match up one-to-one. Um, so, you know, a few months later, I managed to get him to come up. We did a little concert. I think the first concert we did was at Trinity Cathedral in, mm, in Cleveland. Yes. We did a concert mm -hmm. at Trinity Cathedral in Cleveland. I introduced him to an old friend at uh, Cleveland State University, Dr. Tom Tuttle, the late Dr. Tom Tuttle, who was quite impressed with you. And within a few months, he was living in my house <laughs> yeah <laughs> and we had a, and we had a great time we made a lot of great music and that's really how the modern harmonia started he then introduced me to andre pitkivka you can of course tell them your your side of the story guys um Maybe and this would be a good time yeah. to, to hear yeah, that's right. about you and, and then, then we'll hear and then we'll hear about beata too yes yeah. yes who, absolutely who by this time i had actually met but we'll, we'll, well get to that. Uh, yeah, well, I, yeah. I think I'll just backtrack just yeah. a little bit. So, yeah, um, tell your story. Yeah, I came uh, to the States in uh, 92 with a performing group uh, called Let's Chet. Start even further back than that. Even further back? Yeah. Yes, and, and your, you know, how where are you your from? experience, with, yes, where you're from and your experience with folk music. How did you learn to love um, well, I, I grew up with it, but I just, yeah, I just wanted to uh, make that connection where uh, I got to Pittsburgh mm -hmm. through Andre because he he was in Florida and somebody told him, he said, hey, there's this uh, ethnic group in Pittsburgh and uh, they go to university and they pay for scholarship and they play mm -hmm. Eastern European folk music. And he said, do you want to go uh, check it out and audition? I said, sure, why not? So. We went, and that's how we end up in Pittsburgh uh -huh. at Duquesne University and, also, and Matt Walsh. And the Duquesne uh -huh. connection, I have to tell you, this was, you know, that was regarded as the thing to do. If you were a Croatian kid, mm -hmm. boy, if you could get into Duquesne, you were really something. And we had those, they were called Dutam uh, LPs, which we listened to. My, my dad and my aunts were thrilled with these things. But um, go on. Yeah, yeah but so, so there's this... Little connection through that too. So I'm I met with Andre in New York when we were playing in the Ukrainian festivals, and then we end up in Duquesne. But before that, um, I grew up in um, Western Ukraine, in a town called Kolomea, where the Kolomea is coming from. And uh, uh, folk music was around me from early age. I think I started playing instruments um, probably around four and then I decided to my parents want you know asked me if I wanted to go and study uh, folk music when I was six and a half my sister was already playing accordion and piano so older sister so I was always listening what she's playing and, and my father always sang and uh, music was always around the house and um, they said, my, my dad said, do you want to go study music? I said, yeah, sure. What do you want to play, violin or trumpet? And I said, I want to play cymbala. And he said, really, cymbala? Why? I said, well, because I like it. And apparently, they were taking us to um, weddings. And I went to my cousin's wedding in um, a village where my mom is from, Turka, and had a, a, a trio of gypsies playing. One played small cymbala, violin. And, and Buben, the drum. And I was just fascinated with, you know, sticks flying. It was so cool. And I said, you know, I would like to play cymbala. So my dad goes to music school and he said, uh, what's the cost for this? You know, he said, well, if you study violin, it was like 15 rubles a month. Piano was 15, cymbala was five. I said, okay, let's go. <laughs> so, um, and that's how it started. Was it a a small? Yeah, they got me a small cymbala, which is kind of like a hammer dulcimer uh, instrument, and I had uh, one of the teachers tune it for me, do you know some maintenance on it. But in school, we learned the traditional standardized Hungarian tuning system, mm. which is uh, now it's kind of everybody learns That's that standard. standard. Yeah. Hungary, Romania, Slovakia, Ukraine, Moldova, they're all learning the same tuning mm. system. 
and it's there are probably six different systems out there mm -hmm. so and then from there i um started playing um in youth groups and traveling and went to college um got into college uh, to study music in chernivtsi which was a really amazing place um it was like a you know a meeting of ukraine romania Moldova, there's just tons of different people living in Chernivtsi. You walk on the street, you hear people speak Romanian, Yiddish, Ukrainian, Russian, just a lot of big, nice place for uh, for different musics. And I learned a lot from the guys that came from Moldova, the guys from came from Western Ukraine, very different styles of music, mm -hmm. uh, performance techniques. So it was a really great experience and learning classical music on Symbolum, which is, you know, in Ukraine, when they established the, the folk, um, it was called Kafedra, which is um, like a division. The yeah. department of folk instruments. Yeah, so we had to learn folk music and classical. Mm -hmm. So we, we, did, we did twice as much as a classical musicians. So that was really great. You grew with the technique, and also we learn a lot of repertoire. And you studied violin transcriptions. Or? We started. There was a lot of uh, a lot of music written for for Symbolum, but I did a lot of piano, um, violin transcriptions, flute, yeah. classical music was you know a lot of different transcriptions. Mm -hmm. So. And did that give you another? Did that give you anything that you weren't getting from folk music? Did it give you technique, or was it just? more information more exposure to music. uh oh well, definitely that gave me um a huge new um new area where i was you know i was learning from because it was it's just uh classical music is just a completely different uh gigantic area of of knowledge and then we had music history um learning learning tradition classical music and then we had um, learning Ukrainian composers and influence of folk music on their compositions. So that was really uh, phenomenal. I, I would like to jump in for just a second. I have to really say that, you know, because I, I came out of this playing just with guys, initially with guys who were just sort of village musicians. And it was amazing to me to run into these guys, you know, like Alex and Andre, and they're by no means the only ones, or even some of the Hungarian guys I mentioned earlier who had gone through this system because they had just, you know, a, amazing command of their instruments. Uh, there's a tendency among folk musicians who don't, uh, who don't have that background right. to want to play things in the most comfortable keys <clears throat> all the time. And that's, all, and that's all they do. I mean, just for an example, and you know, the flexibility that these guys have. I mean, it's, it's really striking to me. And it's much different than, you know, but of course there's also, there's also the command of the folk stuff, which you yeah. guys were always serious about. Well, and I understand that y you have pretty eclectic tastes. You're also interested in ex some exper experimental music and jazz and you play Well, yeah, that kind of grew <laughs> from that, um, you know, what do you call it, da daredevil or uh, yeah. like a, <laughs> Uh, you know, just kind of uh, see what, what you can do. Um, you know, I moved. And jump in head first. Yeah, I live, lived in New York for probably six years and was exposed to music from all over the world. And I thought, you know, I can read. I can side read anything. I have pretty good technique. What happens if I try somebody else's music, you know? And then I start meeting jazz musicians and they impro improvise and say, oh, let me improvise. I start improvising with my own understanding and my own limitations, whatever, you know. But that led to a lot of different um, great projects. And meeting people like Herbie Mann and Gil Goldstein and just uh, playing with them and, you know, really kind of trying to bring my own um, flavor into their music but what they were looking for is they wanted to um improvise on eastern european music and build on that 
And that was really great collaboration, mm -hmm. you know, so. Then I keep playing classical music as well. Um, every year I get an opportunity to go and last year I played with New York Philharmonic. It was really an amazing experience playing Brahms on oh, the cymbal. Yeah. So. You all also played recently, well, a few years ago, with um, you opened for the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. Yes, we did. Absolutely. We did. Which sounds like an interesting program. Um, and you played the things that inspired Bartok and Kodai and, and, and Tchaikovsky. And Tchaikovsky, Tchaikovsky. Yeah. Tchaikovsky? Yes. Uh, we did, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, when you listen to a lot of classical music that came from Eastern Europe, for us, it's very obvious, like, oh, of course, they u they're using this folk theme, and then it's developing. I went to, to hear uh, Cleveland Orchestra over 4th of July in um, um, Blossom, Blossom Music yeah. Center near Cleveland, mm -hmm. and they played Tchaikovsky's uh, Overture of 1812, and they said, well, this is, this is the uh, fifth song that we sing in the church, in the choir. Mm -hmm. It's just the brass instruments playing it. For people in the audience, they have no idea where this music came from. For us, we make immediate connection, and then hear how it develops. It's like wow. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's like really Americans listening to Appalachian Spring or uh, right. yeah, or they Rodin. connect. Yeah, you, know. exactly. mm -hmm. you, you connect. That so way. for us, when we grew up with folk music, we we're like, wow, that's so brilliant. Where he takes this a uh, little chant from Orthodox um, church service and writes it for. 10 brass instruments, it's so powerful, and then develops it into an overture. It's, it's mind-boggling, you know? Mm -hmm. So we, for us, for me, I really appreciate that mm -hmm. with folk music uh, being influenced in classical. And Andre, why don't we, I don't want to run out of time without hearing you your story. <laughs> yeah. So let's. Well, I probably should begin um, like. We well, begin from like, even childhood. <laughs> childhood <laughs> from childhood. So my, my story, to some extent, is very similar to what happened to Alex and how he started to play timbale. Um, my, I mean, just to begin with, in our household, music was a part of daily life. So you know, my, my father, Ivan Pitkivka, he has a really good voice, and he was always uh, singing on different occasions. Um, and and this whole family, you know, uh, was very oriented on on singing folk songs and so um, so what happened my my father always had this idea to you know his son he wants to um, send him to music school to play um, an instrument classical instrument and um, uh, somehow he picked um, he had the sound of clarinet in in his uh, mind and Good sound. Um, yeah, but uh, somehow it did not click with me. <laughs> <laughs> when I when I went to the music school and uh, you know I heard this kind of uh, squeaky uh, sound that the student was uh, playing in there very poorly, so I decided wasn't that appealing. <laughs> was not appealing to me. And, and um, yeah. but you know just just right across the hallway, you know there was a uh, you know I overheard the sound of this pleasant. Uh, pleasant sound and I didn't know exactly what kind of sound that is and uh, so but so, after a while we found that this is a flute sound of the flute so you know we visited this uh, teacher flute teacher and um, so my father came to the idea okay well the clarinet is out of the you know picture now so now it has to be a flute so the, the flute lesson uh, the first one uh, didn't go very successfully because um, uh, well, the flute, you know, I was a little kid. I started uh, music when I was six, six and a half, I believe, or something like that in that neighborhood. And um, and I was short and little, tiny little boy. And so, you know, there's this, that physical stretch that you have to have to really have a full grasp of, of the instrument. But the flute teacher decided, okay, well, maybe for a semester you can go and study um, there is that instrument called sopilka, which is the folk Ukrainian folk instrument, very similar to Western recorder, as we know. And uh, well, that's actually family that I yeah. play today on a concert, that sopilka family. So I really, it, you know, the, the sound and, and the teacher, we, we had this uh, a mutual connection. And, and so the lessons were wonderful. And um, 
So after the first semester, when I grew up a bit, you know, uh, the idea of my father again it has to be classical music. Um, so he, we switched to a flute. Although, although from that point, it was always, a, a, you know, I, I should say like a double major in this country, like people have. I was always playing um, a two different instruments, and I, I often joke like I have two, two hearts. You know, one heart belongs to classical music, and another one is to folk, folk. music. And um, so I, I started to play flute, although I never, I, um, simultaneously I had two lessons on both instruments and that music school. And, and it kept going for seven years till I entered the uh, music college in my city Lviv, uh, in western part of Ukraine. Not far away from from your from Kolomea. Um, from Kolomea. It's it's about what a couple hours driving. A few hours driving, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, unfortunately, at uh, at the college uh, they did not have. They had a department of folk instruments. However, Sopilka was not taught and was not present at at that college because I should mention that to some extent, folk music in Ukraine during the Soviet Union yeah. was somewhat prohibited, and and somehow Soviets so that you know sopilka was um, a powerful tool yeah. to them and so uh, it's, it's a big it's an important symbol of it Ukrainian was a very important history. symbol of of what ukraine and, and did you bring one with you yes yeah, I yeah. Do. Nice. Um, so you can see it it's it's very you know um if you don't know what sopilka is you would probably call this as a recorder western recorder but it's it's a fully chromatic instrument which gone through some uh, development over the past, I would say, seven, eight decades. And um, so I, but there were some teachers, and actually a very good teacher from um, your um, town. From Kolomea, From yes. Kolomea, who played those instruments and were working on developing this instrument to this academic, you know, kind of conservatory standards. And so this is the final version of, um, at this moment, final version of that instrument. But I was taking uh, flute lessons with the teacher, and everything was just set up there with um, other classes, solfege, music, literature, and everything. And I would study privately this instrument um, through some few different people in, in my city, and also I, I went to travel to different uh, uh, different towns. And, um, and after a while, I have learned um, to, I tried to make this instrument. So a few of them were not successful, but you know, um, so as of now, I, I do make these instruments, um, you know, if, if, if there's a demand. <laughs> mm -hmm. And talk about it as a symbol, um, and why the Soviets were uh, a Very, um, right. Um, overall, you know, music and art, um, there was a nice um, balance, I should say, between sports and arts <laughs> they support it very well however you know some folk instruments as a, like a bandura which is like um, similar to a lute uh, and 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 sopilka was somewhat powerful instrument to them uh, that people connect as of to their roots as being ukrainian uh, because uh, the, the idea was to russify, to russify it, uh, Ukraine yeah. and other parts of the uh, these other 15 rep republics. Um, so that's why this instrument was a um, tool for them to, yeah, I just wanted to, to eliminate. Add, yeah, a really quick, quick uh, footnote. Sopilka was really uh, popular with all the shepherds throughout with all the, the shepherds. Carpathian region. It was a very indigenous instrument. Right. And Bandura came from uh, blind storytellers that would go from village to village and, and tell stories playing bandura, and it was very um, national instruments right. as well. Yeah. So, I mean, those so if you two, the whole singer of tales, yeah, yeah. yeah. in, in yeah. western in western Arts, Ukraine, yeah. when you go to remote villages in the Carpathian Mountains, mm -hmm. you do hear this instrument a lot because of shepherds and, and their tradition and how they make these uh, stories and instruments and just this whole scenario how they live and mm -hmm. connected with, with those instruments. It's a very strong symbol of It is, mm -hmm. it is, it is. And this is where this is where true Ukrainian heart was there, you know, and, and Soviets saw that and so they, they try to remove as much as they can from uh, and, and it's it's you know, in big cities like Lviv, so it was however, you know, um, I yeah, so after college I, I went to the conservatory and um, 
I was a first student, and we're talking about 1990 now, where mm. there's some dramatic changes yes. happened to to this part of the world, and and um, uh, so there was a department of uh, folk instruments and sort of saying ethnomusicology, <laughs> um, and I was a first student official officially on Sopilka, and this is when the first time this instrument was introduced to the conservatory on that level, conservatory level. And I had an amazing teacher who, uh, Miroslav Korczynski, who is um, a composer and who uh, composed many, many pieces uh, for this instrument and the family of those instruments, because we're not talking about only one uh, Sopilka as a recorder type of instrument. It, it comes with uh, a good baggage. <laughs> Yeah, a full uh, set. Yeah. A full set of, of different toys, uh, you know. Um, and, you know, uh, you, you know, when you... So conservatory, uh, I, I started to work and play with different professional groups, uh, most of them uh, dance uh, uh, s uh, companies that use professional um, orchestra, and in that orchestra there had to be an uh, element of folk, um, folk instruments, and Supilka was one of them. Uh, Zimbabwe uh, was a very popular instrument, um, so I always had um, a full set of different, uh, you know, Sopilka-like instruments with me, and I played piccolo and flute, whatever needed to be played, and, you know, I was lucky to to travel to many different countries, and, and even during the Soviet Union, the first time I came here was in 1986, when I was a freshman in college. Mm. Um, so at that moment, um, you know, we were representing the the, the the culture of Ukraine during the Soviet Union. You know, in 1992, when I came here, uh, it was a slightly different mission, I would say, because we we came here as a you know independent, nobody sort of followed us. Let's say playing for Ukrainian community. Playing for Ukrainian community because yeah. at that point, you know, Ukraine was um, very close. You know, to independence. To, to in yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were hungry for this type of music. They were they were just observing every, you know, piece of information that was coming from their music and songs and everything that was new. So um, that's how I ended up here. And, uh, yeah, we met. How did we meet, Alex? We met at the Ukrainian Festival Upstate New York. Verkhovena. Verkhovena, right. And, and so um, I came here with a, a, a similar band, uh, a folk ensemble, that Alex came. You came with Cheris, right, and mm -hmm. I came with Oberehe. So we had, um, um, yeah, you had in your band a person who played Sopilka and clarinet. Yeah, right? and so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and um, so we had another cymbalist, uh, cymbal player with our band, and you know, after a while, we kind of connected and we started to play some uh, in different uh, engagements and festival, uh, you know, mostly in Ukrainian community. Mostly. You, you all still play a lot of Ukrainian festivals. Yes. Or yeah. Festivals for a variety of communities. Variety of yes. yes. communities. And that yes. seems like that's a really important it part. It is a very important part of our yeah. life, yeah. Um, and, uh, and not just festivals, I mean, weddings and, weddings. you know, mm -hmm. all sorts of things mm -hmm. like this. And it's mm -hmm. very important to stay connected mm -hmm. with. Your with Absolutely. Your, yeah. the various yeah. communities oh, yeah. of the music that you play. Mm -hmm. It's not just sort of a smorgasbord on offer for. It's you know, it's mutual mm -hmm. exchange. This is which is great. Also, yeah. like right. the, the audience here, but mm -hmm. it's also mm -hmm. a big part of what you do to connect with. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think it. Keep, you know, I I wouldn't be the first person to say this, but I mean, it keeps it real, I, in the sense that makes it be the it's kind organic of real, way to do it it's yeah. organic it's, it's the real music it's the, the music we we you know we learn from from the community mm -hmm. like being a young kid you know um that's the music i heard you know uh, villagers played some music in in villages and and now we giving back um you know oh, on absolutely. a professional level totally and, totally and i mean you know. you know what we play on stage i mean certainly we have pieces that are highly arranged <laughs> that are based on folk themes, but are our arrangements. I mean, I think that would be fair to say about our the Bukovina melodies. We didn't play it today, but it's on our, our CD. I mean, that mm -hmm. that's an arrangement of things. But on the other hand, uh, you know, some of what we play on stage and virtually all of what we play when we play at a, a festival or a wedding or a picnic, this is stuff that's not really arranged. That's being played as as as, 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 tradi as traditionally played. Alive. 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 What, what yeah. also astonishes me is 
I mean, I, I did mention before that, uh, you know, certainly in East European communities, particularly those where we're a couple generations in, it's not unusual to have uh, a band that's somewhat mixed. We are more mixed, though, than usual, and it, it somewhat astonishing to me the extent to which our band, uh, with Alex in it, has really become a fixture in, in Cleveland's Hungarian community, for example. You know, my gosh, he's a Ukrainian. Usually they don't believe it. It's yeah. the first thing they come up to him and they speak to him in Hungarian. Yeah, um, I learned how to say, uh, yeah. well, then, and then they I say, don't speak and then they say, really? or then they'll say, oh, he must be from Munkac, which is the, yeah. the, 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 across the border. Munkac, well, the places that's right on the border, which is not quite, but. I'm uh, pretty close to Munkac. But we yeah. play the, you know, and in part with that, I we know, when we play a Hungarian job, I know what tunes we need to be playing. Okay. We also have, you know, the good luck with our violinists. And actually, we have more than one violinist. You heard Stephen today on our recordings and also who plays with us is another young guy from, well, 30s is young to me, uh, from uh, from Slovakia, from Puchov, Slovakia, who's uh, Jozef Janisz, who was interested when he was back there, he was interested not just in Slovak, but also in Hungarian and all other kinds of music. He also ended up going... Uh, a few years after you guys, you yeah, ended up going to Duquesne for Duquesne a year. Tambor, it's, yeah. But, you know, so when we do that kind of gig, then, okay, I say, okay, here's what, here's what we're going to play. Here's the ones that my, you know, my mom knew. Here's the ones that the people in the audience are going to want to play. And then, and of course, you always have to keep your ear open. Mm -hmm. yeah. When we play a Ukrainian... And Joseph is pretty brave. Oh, jo he he's brave. He learns a lot. He's brave. He's, he's brave. Forward. He's yeah. good. He's good. He's good. I mean, both these these guys have two. Well, the unifying strength that these two guys have is that they're both wonderful musicians, and they're both excellent violinists, and they have complementary strengths in what in what they do. And then if we're going to go play a uh, if we're going to go play a Ukrainian gig, well, then you guys call the tunes. You guys say, yeah. "This is what we need to learn. This is what we got to play," because you know. Uh, you know, the same thing, you know, whether we're playing Croatian, uh, Romanian, well, Romanian, we collaborate when we do that, um, but a lot of it's based on what uh, what we've learned from other musicians, some of which we learned from Joe Varga, some of which we learned from our friend Georgie Trumbitsash, and other stuff from just, you know, me and him observing, you know, he was playing, he did use the word Moldavians, which in the days that you were playing in Chernivtsi when it was still the Soviet Union, well, that was seen as a separate ethnic group, mm. officially. Yeah, well, but, because of the because of the big the, region Moldova. Yeah, because of the big region Moldova. But you know, I mean, this is you you know Romanian styling from this. Mm, yeah, you know. they're ethnically a, a, a Romanian yeah, they're speaking Romanian population. Sub, they're Romanian speak, subgroup, yeah. sort of. Yeah, I mean, I guess we'll leave that to the to the, the politicians. Yeah. Of course, the, oh, go on. No, no, oh. one, one thing yeah. I was going to say was one of the amazing things about Harmonia is that um, when, whereas often you will have a group of traditional musicians who are all from a single tradition mm -hmm. who play right. together, but you all are a group of incredible traditional musicians from a variety of exactly. traditions, and you share that with each other. Do you, do you all feel like that when, you, when Harmonia is playing Ukrainian music that it feels different? to you than when you're playing with a group of Ukrainians? I mean, it seems like you guys are so in sync. You're absolutely right. I, I feel like I play, when I play with Harmonia, it's, to me, is the same as I would play with some other band in Ukraine, you know, who are just highly skilled musicians and uh, and, and sound tight as they were mm -hmm. playing together for 20-some years. And this is how I feel. And I, I, I'm very proud that, that we actually you know, found each other here because you know you're you're so far away from your home country and oh, yeah. you really do the music that you grew up and you love and and you you grow on on this music. You know. Well, I think I think while we do come from different traditions, I think we come from overlapping traditions. I mean, it's like, yes, yeah. you know, yes, like, that's, it's like harmony is a giant Venn diagram. You know, where <laughs> all those circles are overlapping in the middle. Yeah. 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 And you have several Slovak members. We do, yeah, and, yeah. I, and we have a very key Slovak member we should mention, <laughs> and that's Thank our singer, so. yeah. our, our singer uh, Beata Bekaniova. Uh, I met Beata again, mid '90s, early '90s. I'm a little hazy on it, 
because she came over with a group called Shadi Shun, which was a dance group, and she sang with it. And I heard her sing, and I saw her, and I was uh, totally thrilled with this because, wow, you know, a real and a beautiful voice and a group that's really doing Slovak music and they're not on 78s and they're playing traditional on, nice, and they're nice, playing nice. on tra traditional stuff on traditional instruments and i mean i think the first time i remember seeing her was in the basement of the Akron Jednota club that's a Slovak club after after a concert and it was really fun and we were friends with with her in the mid 90s and i never thought it never occurred to me to ask somebody of her caliber, you know, would you sing with us? And then there was this meeting where she came and said, hey, I want to get together with you guys. Would you guys let me sing with you? This was about 99, 98? Mm, yeah, something like that. Somewhere around, the, somewhere around there, you know, and, and things came together. Because um, the other thing that did happen is we were, around that time, we were, well, I mean, I, the group was really was really gelling uh, instrumentally. You know, we had, a, I think, a clear picture of what we wanted to do. We realized we needed a vocalist. I mean, we had, we had tried somebody out who was quite good, but there were difficulties. Uh, and so we were sort of, sort of looking around. And we were, I was flabbergasted when Beata asked to sing with us. It was wonderful. That was perfect. And then it was that, right, right about that time that Arts Midwest contacted us. And uh, there was a state folklorist, uh, Richard March, in Wisconsin, who had known me for years and years and years and said, hey, you know, you've got to con consider these guys. So they gave us a little bit of training on, certainly not on how to play, but on how to go about putting our stuff on the stage. Because, you know, it was really only around that time that I was even thinking of doing this. When I found at Harmonia, I said, okay, we're going to play birthday parties, we're going to play weddings, and, and that's you know, that sort of know. stuff, which is fun, and I, and I, I really love it. I mean, yeah. we just played a Slovak wedding two weeks ago, and we had a, mm -hmm. had a total blast. But, you know, the idea of finding a way to what it takes to kind of share this with the whole country, uh, which is what we proceeded to do. And so we have this mix of stuff, and that was very helpful. But, and also, Bath is pretty fearless, too. You know, yeah, she's and again, you know, she's got. She comes from a family that is just filled with folk music. Her her dad, how many, you, uh, countless songs. He sang for four hours nonstop. Yeah, we recorded him. Yeah, these yeah, yeah people just it's uh, unbelievable. At at their wedding, it was well. I guess we can come clean, clean on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, Alex and, and Beata are married to each other, and I encouraged him to marry her too. Yeah. I, I, I said, that's, that's the girl for you, and it, it's worked out pretty well. And it was a heck of a wedding, I'll tell you. I bet it was. But as I say, she came from a very musical family. I mean, her family is from actually a very artistic village. She's, her, the family is originally from uh, Medzi Laborce in eastern Slovakia. Uh, she. Uh, that happens to be the village that Andy Warhol's family is mm -hmm. from. And they're, you know, I mean, I, I don't know how to put it. I mean, okay, I, I guess they're Karpetha Rusins. Karpetha Rusin, yeah. But she was educated because of, again, this, the system that was in place, she was educated in uh, Ukrainian. So right off the bat, she spoke and sang in three languages, three languages in you know, Karpetha Rusin and in standard Ukrainian and in Slovak. And she speaks Czech. And she speaks Czech, and she knows Russian, and she speaks beautiful English, and sings in it. Yeah. Uh, she sings in Romani, uh, and which is probably, if she'd stayed in Slovakia, is not something she would be doing. No. In fact, it raises some eyebrows that she would be singing in Romani, which is the language of the gypsies. Um, and she sings in Croatian and Serbian. I mean, it, it, and in fact... Yeah, we have Serbian friends who always want to invite us to play at their parties. Cause, and I think it, it yeah. would go, it probably would, would uh, you know, everyone would relate. I would probably never play, um, you know, some other music, you yeah. know, jazz, if I stayed playing in Ukraine, yeah. in yeah. the state ensemble. It or would be a yeah. more traditional kind of written out, um, you know, score arrangement. that you would just, yeah. arrangement that you would follow and go for. Uh, here, uh, I, you know, exactly the same thing I want to share that. When I came to this country, I was, you know, just open-minded to different kind of yeah. music and work and collaborating with different musicians and 
and um, you know even even some uh, you know film film music people yeah. use all these different instruments that they have yeah. like Howard Shore for well, you example did, oh, you Lord, did the Lord of, Lord, you did Lord Lord of the, the Rings, Rings you know yeah we both played for a couple productions so uh, it's um, it's incredible what you know this uh, folk instruments uh, how we can use them now in in an environment in where you have lots of influences and, and other masters that you can right. interact with. You know, right. there's one other thing I think that happens with how we play and, and what we do in Harmonia, and again, and, which is a function of being in the United States, is not only are we doing things that are sort of from geographically different regions, but we're also playing things that are from different sort of regions in time. You know, mm -hmm. because of the I guess you could say an immigrant nostalgia. Uh, we are playing things that might not be popular even among folk music fans in in Europe right now. I mean, I certainly know with the Hungarian stuff, the Croatian stuff too. Uh, we're you know playing older songs, things that you know things from my grandparents' generation that I you know for me and for people in my generation we want to hold on to. Because uh, we see that, oh, that's the real stuff, and you, you and you see this in you see this in the U.S. a lot, where depending when people come, what they want is what they consider to be the real stuff. I'm sure, you know, a hundred years from now, they're going to be, you know, uh, Ukrainian and Russian American kids in the U.S. are saying, oh, do you know how to play on 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 mini discs and keyboards the way that grandpa's <laughs> had it as well. Because yeah. <laughs> that's the thing we're up against. You know, we're yeah. up against uh, we're up against electronic keyboards. Not that we never ever ever use them, and we certainly never use them uh, in a concert. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that we were sort of up against, uh, certainly with the Slovaks and to an extent the Hungarians. And I guess to an extent the Ukrainians too, the Ukrainian Americans, is that as the people who played this kind of, this level of folk music, as they sort of faded away or in some cases moved away, certainly in the case of the, the Cleveland Gypsies, a lot of them just ended up moving to Vegas and Texas and places like that, mm -hmm. you know, kind of following the trail of money, which I can't blame a working musician. Mm -hmm. But what filled the void was people who, you know, knew how to play on sort of band instruments and accordions and things like that. and. And you ended up with polka bands, which are certainly a valid expression of folk music. And yes, I'm very proud that there is such a thing as Cleveland style uh, polka. But it's only it, part of the story. It's only right. part of the story, and it's not the part that I relate to. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad we're able to do this and keep something going that mm -hmm. otherwise, you know, otherwise almost disappeared, or in some cases, kind of disappeared for. A decade or two, and, and it's back while it's still in living memory. Well, Harmony is an incredibly exciting band to listen to, and I want to thank you guys so much for the beautiful concert that you played earlier today, thank you. Thank and you. for doing this oral history with us, which will go up on the web. So thank you to um, Walt, thank you. Alexander, and Andre. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, and thanks very much to the Library of Congress. We are honored to have you. Yeah. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.